Hi, thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Chu from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. And with me today, I have Naeem Bojani from Montreal. Welcome. We're here to talk today about urosepsis after ureteroscopy. So Naeem, you've got a case. Yeah, so we thought we'd start with a, a simple case of ureteroscopy. So we, we have a 67-year-old female with a long history of stone disease, uh, undergone many procedures. As you can see from her scan, she has a uh, trophic right kidney. She's known for diabetes and an increased BMI. She presents with left flank pain, no history of infection. Her culture was negative. She has a five millimeter mid ureteral stone, as well as a six to seven millimeter stone in her lower pole of her left kidney. Uh, at the time, she had an elevated creatinine, and so a stent was placed. Any thoughts on this case, Ben? Uh, this is a tough case because she's diabetic and it looks like there's a giant stone in her right ureter which caused her right kidney to become atrophic. So really she has a solitary function in kidney. She is obese. Uh, she's not particularly elderly but she does have a lot of comorbidities and I think this is a, a, a bit of a scary situation. So I, I agree with just stenting to try to get her creatinine down, have her normalize. I do not think she's a good candidate for shockwave lithotripsy given where the stone is as well as the patient's body habitus. So I think definitely doing a ureteroscopy would be a good idea. Yeah, so uh, about a year ago, uh, you and I spoke and, and we thought, you know, it'd be interesting to look at um, risk factors in these patients uh, for the development of sepsis after ureteroscopy. And so this was published uh, just earlier this year, a systematic review and meta-analysis that we did, uh, where we examined over 250 articles. We selected 13 that met our eligibility criteria. Uh, we had almost 6,000 patients. And we wanted to look at two things. One, the incidence of urosepsis, and the second, the risk factors for urosepsis after ureteroscopy. And what we found was the pool incidence of urosepsis after ureteroscopy in these studies was 5%. Uh, were you surprised by that, Ben? You know, initially I was. I thought that was actually quite high. But then after thinking about it and thinking about the patients that come back in, or the patients that you don't actually see, because sometimes they go to another hospital, then you hear about it and get a report. I think it actually is real. And I know this is a, a, a meta-analysis, but uh, we're going to show some data later on that is a bit more rigorous looking at actual real-world data. But uh, I think it probably is a real number. Yeah, absolutely. And when we looked at the studies, uh, it, was, it was very varied. It went from 0.2% all the way up to almost 18%. Um, and, and I think also the definition of sepsis is very variable uh, in the literature, so that probably played a role as well. Uh, in terms of risk factors, we examined 13 risk factors and we found six that were statistically significant predictors of urosepsis after ureteroscopy. Uh, we had patients who had the placement of a preoperative stent, a preoperative positive urine culture, patients uh, who are known for diabetes or ischemic heart disease, and then uh, older age patients and a duration of surgery. So the longer the duration of the surgery, the higher the risk of urosepsis after ureteroscopy. So the European section did a similar study too, but theirs was a systematic review. So this is a bit different from what we did, which was a meta-analysis, which pools all the data and makes it into one big study. A systematic review looks at all of the case series and literature that is actually out there. So uh, the meta-analysis that we did is a little bit more rigorous, but still they found that out of all these patients, that about 3.9% of them actually had infectious complications. Now, only seven of the papers actually reported on sepsis, and they found a 0.51% incidence of that uh, being septic. And of all the complications, only 6.5% of them were sepsis. So again, this is a bit limited by the type of data you put in and the fact of what's out there in the literature, and ours was a meta-analysis, but still something you'd sort of go upon. And they found very similar things to what we found, that uh, to reduce the risk of shorter operative time, to treat preoperative urinary tract infections, as well as antibiotic prophylaxis helped. And in addition to that, they also found that patients with higher comorbidity, as well as elderly with longer procedural times and who were pre-stented, actually had higher risk of urosepsis. Um, unlike our study though, they actually found that the female gender, the neurogenic bladder patients, and patients with high BMI also had risk factors as well too. So three things that we didn't find, but that they found in theirs. We found six that were statistically significant predictors of urosepsis, but that doesn't mean that there are other risk factors, as you mentioned. So this is the study that we just completed that you had mentioned previously, Ben. Uh, so we wanted to confirm what we found in our meta-analyses in terms of incidence of urosepsis. And so we took a large uh, data set, the IBM MarketScan data set, and we looked at uh, ICD-9 and uh, CPT codes to identify ureteroscopy cases, and then we looked at the incidence of urosepsis. Uh, 
the incidence of urosepsis uh, was 5.5%, so very similar to what we found in our meta-analyses. We then looked at the cost associated with a septic event. So a normal ureteroscopy costs almost $18,000, but when the patient has a septic event, the cost skyrockets to almost $50,000. We also looked at severe septic events compared to septic events, and the cost again increased to almost $70,000. So not only is urosepsis a, a very dangerous and morbid uh, scenario, but it's also a very costly uh, situation. Naeem, what, are, what did we talk about in terms of the difference between severe versus just sepsis? Severe sepsis is basically those patients uh, who uh, either had to go to the ICU, had to uh, undergo uh, the use of pressors, stayed in the hospital uh, for a longer period of time, which all obviously increased their medical costs. So it was the really sick patients then. I'd like to talk about time to treatment after stent placement. David Lifshitz did a retrospective study looking at all the patients who developed urosepsis and looked at the time that they had their stent placed. Essentially, this red line here shows that if you have your ureteroscopy done within four weeks, your risk of urosepsis is definitely minimized. If you do the final ureteroscopy after four weeks, your risk of getting urosepsis after ureteroscopy increases quite greatly. And then you did, looked at some data as well too, Naeem. We did a similar study uh, using the same IBM uh, data set uh, from the same July 2014 to July 2019, we looked at all patients who had ureteroscopy after the placement of a stent. Uh, and then we also uh, separated the time periods from uh, stent placement to ureteroscopy. Uh, and we looked at zero to 15 days, 16 to 30 days, 31 to 60 days, and then greater than 60 days. And what we found was the longer you waited, the more uh, healthcare utilization occurred. Uh, so there was more ED visits, more inpatient visits, uh, more complications, uh, more imaging was required, and of course, medical costs increased as well. So with every time period uh, over two weeks, uh, all of these uh, healthcare resource utilizations increased. And so uh, our recommendation really, if possible, is to perform the ureteroscopy within two weeks after the placement of a ureteral stent, if it is possible. So how about antibiotics? What do we do for antibiotics? So uh, a, a study from the Clinical Research Office of the Endourology Society, so this is a study looking at 11,000 patients from the ureteroscopy study, looked at patients with negative preoperative urine cultures undergoing ureteroscopy. And they looked at patients who received preoperative antibiotics versus those who did not, and they did not find any difference in terms of patients who had a UTI or fever afterwards. So, if you have a negative preoperative urine culture, there's really no point in giving postoperative antibiotics. But they did find was that female gender and patients with a higher ASA score or basically worse comorbid conditions actually had a higher risk for postoperative infection. We did a, a study here as well as at um, Boston, and we found that we Patients who received antibiotics postoperatively versus those who did not actually had no difference in postoperative urinary tract infections. Uh, even though the patients who went home with antibiotics actually had a slightly higher rate, it was not significant. So definitely just giving one dose of antibiotics at the time of surgery is sufficient and the rate of infection afterwards uh, does not change. So Ben, what are your thoughts for a patient who has a, a number of risk factors for urosepsis after ureteroscopy? Would you consider giving them a preoperative antibiotics or even postoperative antibiotics? I think that's what we're trying to show here. We're looking at the data and trying to identify who is actually at risk for getting sepsis. So like we talked about patients who were pre-stented, have higher comorbidities, and are uh, female gender, all these other things. I think that we should take these into account and they, we should consider giving them antibiotics if they've presented with the septic episode, with that stone and all these other things. And as they add up, I think we need to consider that both pre and post. But just for your regular run of the mill, negative preoperative urine culture, I would not. So I think the whole point of our research here is to not to treat everyone like a cookbook or cookie cutter type of, of um, uh, methodology, but to actually take into each case by case and determine whether or not they need uh, antibiotics or not. How should we prevent urosepsis from ureteroscopy? One of the thoughts is whether to use a ureteral access sheath or not. 
and uh, Olivier Traxer and Jean de Rosette, again from the Crows Group, looked at whether or not in that big patient population, whether or not having a ureteral access sheath actually reduced the risk of sepsis or not. And what they found was that having a ureteral access sheath actually reduced the risk of sepsis by one third. Certainly their rate of sepsis was quite higher than ours at 15% and ours was four and 4% 4 here for the ureteral access sheath group. So their study does say and does support that using a ureteral access sheath will decrease the risk of postoperative infection. There are some other studies, however, with a lot smaller patients, and this one was in patients with stones greater than two centimeters, and many of them required more than one surgery. This study showed that using a ureteral access sheath did not, incre did not decrease the risk of getting uh, sepsis afterwards. Again, a much smaller study, and you can find studies on both sides. Yeah, I think this is uh, really interesting data and, and a very interesting subject that's, uh, that's uh, evolving uh, quite uh, rapidly. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense, right? If you put in a ureteral axis sheath, we know that that'll decrease the pressure and probably will reduce the risk of infection. But I think the data is still, um, is still uh, up in the air, uh, whether it's really associated or not. Uh, but I think time will tell. So for uncomplicated patients with no history of sepsis, no history of hydronephrosis, and again, no sepsis with that particular stone, there's really no need for pre-op antibiotics. Just give them that single dose of antibiotics at the time of the ureteroscopy. And then whether you use a ureteral access sheath, as you said, Naeem, the data is still kind of out there. And I think one of the problems that we have is that we just don't have a very reliable way of measuring the pressure. Previously, we re relied on special types of guide wires, special catheters, or patients with nephrostomy tubes. So I think once we get a reliable way of measuring that, I think we'll be able to do very valid and very uh, good studies to determine whether or not it actually helps with decreasing postoperative sepsis. So let's get back to your case. Um, after talking about all this, yeah, I think that uh, when we look at our case now, uh, there's a number of factors here to, to, to take into consideration. First of all, uh, it's a female patient. Uh, she's 67 years old. She has a history of diabetes. She has increased BMI. Uh, and there's the placement of a ureteral stent. So these are all risk factors for urosepsis after ure ureteroscopy. And so I think this patient uh, really needs to be uh, followed closely. Uh, and I wonder uh, you know, if she could probably benefit from some antibiotics preoperatively and, and maybe postoperatively. Your thoughts, Ben? So I, I agree with you. I think that this is not your typical run-of-the-mill ureteroscopy where there's a negative preop urine culture, you're just gonna give her one dose and send her home. I think it would be valid to try and A, do this within two to four weeks, first of all, be before, uh, uh, after stent placement, and also giving, them, uh, giving her preoperative antibiotics and as well as considering postoperative. Uh, would you consider admitting her to hospital postoperatively? Yeah, I, I definitely would. Uh, this patient, I think, is at uh, high risk of uh, urosepsis. So, you know, I think keeping her in hospital for 24 hours is probably a good idea just to make sure she doesn't spike a fever or, or go into, uh, into sepsis. So, Naeem, I'd like to thank you for being with us here today, and thank you to the viewers for joining us. Thank you, Ben. It was a pleasure.